Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for August 2023. My name's Hayley and this month I'm going to concentrate on what we can see around the constellation of Perseus and that will include the Perseids meteor shower and the open cluster M34. We'll also take a look at opportunities to observe the gas giant planets Saturn and Jupiter and there are two supermoons to look out for this month. Let's begin by taking a look at the positions of the Moon and the planets. In my opinion, the best planet to look out for this month is the planet Saturn. You can see that I'm looking towards the south here on the 1st of August at around 11 o'clock. Saturn has already ris risen. It reaches opposition on the 27th of August, but is well placed for observing throughout the month. The 1st of August probably isn't the best day to observe because we've got the really bright full Moon in the way. So I'm just going to go... To a different day and if you observe a little bit later into the early hours of the morning you will get a little bit more altitude and if you were to observe with a telescope you should be able to see Saturn's rings you should be able to see Saturn's bright moon Titan this month is a really good time to do a little mini observing project on Saturn if you would like to because there is a effect on the rings known as the opposition effect and what that is is the rings appear to brighten as we get to opposition and then dim again so if you observe Saturn throughout the month and make a note of how bright you feel the rings are in comparison to the surface of the planet and then see if you notice a brightening around opposition Jupiter is also well placed for observing during August so you can see here that um, we're in the middle of the month now and Jupiter has already risen. And if we go just go back to the beginning of the month, um, you can see that Jupiter is lower and rises around midnight at the beginning of the month, getting earlier as the month goes on. So Jupiter gets better and better place for observation towards the end of August, but you can observe it all throughout the month really, really well. The moon makes a close approach to both planets um, during the month. It makes a, its closest approach to Saturn on the third, fourth, third or the fourth, early hours of the morning on the third, early hours of the morning on the fourth, and then Jupiter on the eighth. And it gets close enough to Jupiter that I think you'll be able to get them both into the field of view of a pair of reasonably sized binoculars, so you can have a go at that as well. Mercury, Venus and Mars are all pretty badly placed for observing for most of the month. Um, if we go back to the 1st of August and go to 8 o'clock when the, the sun is still up. And I'm going to do a little trick to reveal what's in the sky and that is to turn the atmosphere off. And you can see that we've got Venus, Mercury, Mars and the Sun over here. So if I just put my mouse on Mars so that we can still see where it is when we put the atmosphere back on. So if we speed up time and just watch the sunset on the first of the month, you can see that Venus, Mercury and Mars are all setting before the sky gets dark. So we're not going to be able to observe them very easily. Venus pops back out into the morning sky towards the end of the month. And I'll mention that again a little bit later. But certainly the best planets for observing this month are going to be Jupiter and Saturn. Let's take a look at the moon now. And our moon watch challenge for August is to see if you can observe two supermoons. Normally we only get to see one full moon in any month, but August is one of those special cases where we actually get to see two full moons. The first one occurring on the 1st of August and the second one on the 31st. Both of these full moons also happen to be supermoons, and a supermoon is when the full moon coincides with perigee, or the closest approach that the moon makes to the Earth on its orbit. And when that happens, the moon appears to be larger and brighter than full moons that occur when the moon is at other points on its orbit. And the difference when you're observing with the naked eye is actually quite small, but there is another effect that comes into play, which is known as the moon illusion. And that is when the moon appears to be bigger when viewed close to the horizon. And both of this month's full moons will stay fairly low. So if you go out and observe them, you're, it's likely that you'll be observing them when they're close to the horizon and you'll get this combined effect of the supermoon and the moon illusion, which will hopefully make the moon appear quite a lot bigger than it normally does. The second full moon 
it will also be known as a blue moon because anytime you have two full moons in a month, the second one is known as a blue moon. So the full moon on the 31st of August will be known as a super blue moon. Let's move around to Perseus now, our constellation of the month. I've chosen Perseus because it's the home of the Perseids meteor shower and I thought it would be nice to talk about the constellation itself and then talk about meteor shower. It's fairly easy to locate in August because it's not too far away from the planet Jupiter. We need to wait until it's a little bit higher in the sky. So the early hours of the morning is good. You can see Jupiter over here. So if you look upwards and towards the left of Jupiter or going from around 10 o'clock on Jupiter's disk, then that will take you to the constellation of Perseus. The other way to locate it, if Jupiter wasn't so conveniently placed, is you can have a look between the familiar shapes of Cassiopeia the Queen, looking like a W at the moment, and Taurus the Bull and the, the Pleiades open star cluster. If you look between these two, you can find the constellation of Perseus. The constellation is named after the Greek hero Perseus, and if I put the art on, you can see Perseus depicted here with the head of the Gorgon Medusa in his hand. Um, Perseus also contains the, a really famous star named, known as Algol, which is an eclipsing binary star, and that star is also uh, known as the demon star and is said to represent the head of Medusa and you can see it here depicting one of Medusa's eyes. The story goes that Medusa was um, a creature with a hair made of snakes and a gaze that turned any living thing into stone when they looked upon it and in the stories Perseus used his shield as a mirror to avoid her gaze and that enabled him to slay her and use her head to turn his enemies into stone. For our deep sky object for this month, I've chosen the open cluster M34, which appears in the constellation of Perseus. The way to locate it is to have a look between this star, Mirfak, which is the brightest star in Perseus, and this one in triangular, Mizan. And the cluster is located roughly in the middle between these two stars, and you can see it just here if I put my mouse on it and pop the binoculars on. So this is the open cluster M34. You can see that the binocular view will just show it as really a fuzzy patch. It's an open cluster fairly close to the Earth containing around 100 stars and technically it is visible to the naked eye in really good conditions um, but you're better off trying to find it with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. I think it would be very difficult to spot with the naked eye. Um, so you can see here a, a rough idea of what it might look like in a pair of binoculars and if we go to a small telescope point of view just to give you an idea of what that might look like. Um, so this is roughly what it would look like with a 20 mil eyepiece in a 70 mil refracting telescope. So you can see that you get a bit of a better view of it if you use a small telescope rather than a pair of binoculars. While we're in the constellation of Perseus, we can take a look at the Perseids meteor shower. If I zoom out a bit, you can see the radiant of the Perseids is up here. The meteor shower is named after the constellation of Perseus because that's the home of its radiant. And the radiant is the point in the sky where the meteors appear to originate from. The Perseids is one of the most famous meteor showers. It comes from the debris left over by Comet Swift-Tuttle, which orbits the sun once every 133 years. You can see it here when it last passed by us in 1992. And it has a nucleus that is 16 miles wide, which is pretty big. It's more than twice the size of the object that is thought to have caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. We don't need to worry about it, though, because astronomers have calculated that it poses little threat to us. As comets travel through the solar system, they leave a dusty trail. And when the Earth passes through the trails, the particles collide with our atmosphere and burn up, causing us to see a meteor shower. So when you're out this month observing the Perseids, what you're actually seeing is burning bits of comet entering our atmosphere and putting on this amazing show for us. Most of the particles that cause the meteors are the size of grains of sand. But if you're lucky, you might see a fireball, which is something that is caused by a larger sized piece burning up and they can put on quite a show. 
the Perseids are known for producing bright meteors and fireballs, so you've got a pretty good chance of seeing one if you do manage to get out and observe the meteor shower this year. The peak occurs in the early hours of the 13th of August, so um, the best thing to do is to go out at from around 11 o'clock on the 12th and observe all the way through if you can until about 3 a.m. on the 13th. Um, if the weather's not good or you're not available on that day, then you can try the couple of days before and the couple of days after and you, st you should still see some meteors. The moon is really well placed this year. It's a waning crescent and it will be out of the way for most of the night. So um, that's really good because if you have a bright moon in the way, then that can wash out the fainter meteors. You can look in any direction. You don't need to look towards the radiant. If you are looking towards the radiant, you'll see meteors with shorter trails. The thing to do is to aim for an altitude of around 60 degrees in the sky and look in any direction you like and um, let your eyes adapt to the dark. So go outside about 20 minutes before you want to really start observing. Give your eyes a chance to adapt to the dark and then don't look at anything bright. Don't look at any white light sources after that 20 minutes, because if you do, you'll ruin your dark adaption and you'll have to start again. Um, you, if you need to, you can use a red torch because a red torch won't ruin your dark adaption. Um, and if you want to use a, you know, a, an app on your phone or some planetarium software, quite a lot of them now have a red mode and you can switch on the red mode and then that won't damage your dark adaption either. My favourite way to observe a meteor shower is to lie back on a sun lounger or something like that with a blanket and hot drink and um, just look up and see how many I can spot. It, you, th you might think that you won't get very cold, but if you're lying in one position outside at night, even in the summer for a long period of time, you might get cold. So it's definitely a good idea to wrap up nice and warm. I'd like to finish now by just taking a look at the International Space Station. The best time to find it this month is towards the end of the month and the brightest and highest altitude pass is predicted to be on the 29th at 5.01 in the morning, roughly. Um, there we go, it's already in the sky. So... Um, as always, you can watch the ISS as it goes over. It takes about five minutes, um, rising in the west and setting again in the east. The other thing that you can do if you do happen to be out in the early hours of the morning towards the end of the month is you can catch up with Venus. So um, we talked about the beginning of the month. It was getting close to inferior conjunction and getting really close to the sun and not in a, a good position for observing. But in the last week of August, um, it pops out into the morning sky again as a really thin crescent. So um, it will be nice to add Venus to the collection of planets that you see in August and you can do that during the last week of the month. That brings me to the end of our tour for August. I hope you have clear skies for all of your observing this month, especially if you decide to go out and try and catch some meteors.